Sorry about that, family. Here we go. Of course, it's early today where I'm at right now doing this recording with my brother. But at the end of the day, I want to introduce you guys to a student. But we're all students in this, a student of Greek culture and history. And he's all the way in Australia, family. So I'm recording this like 6 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. All right. I want to introduce you guys to a wonderful guy who has, has shown me and taught me a lot about the Greek culture. We've had conversations about the language. In person today, you have one of the great minds I've ever met regarding the Greek culture. A student of the history, Mr. John Kuban. How are you today, my brother? Thanks for having me, Garfield. I'm very well, thanks. It's, it's late here in Sydney as well. Um, we've got to do what we've got to do. It's been uh, long awaiting. Yeah, definitely. Um, today, can you give us a little background about yourself and the Greek culture and history in your studies? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I'm basically a uh, content creator. I'm an independent researcher. <clears throat> I have a couple of groups on Facebook and I go ahead and uh, I produce work uh, of Greek literature that people haven't seen in regards to um, Hellenic uh, philosophy. Um, the Greek religion, piety, and uh, in philosophy. So I kind of go ahead and um, teach the public and uh, Greeks about their own ancestral traditions that go far beyond Christianity and all that. So I kind of um, want to reawaken people about the Greek virtues and Hellenism and how important it is today to be, kind of live with some of these virtues. Um, so I do have philosophy groups. I consider myself a philosopher who practice and experience. <clears throat> Um, I actually, I am promoting Stoicism, a type of Greek philosophy here in Australia. Um, but on top of that, Garfield, I'm, I'm not actually here to speak about philosophy or any of that. Um, I'm actually a native Greek. <clears throat> and the reason why you have me on today is because there's a um, particular word that we're going to speak about, <clears throat> a Greek word. Um, I actually, here in Australia, my parents noticed that um, I started to learn English faster than I was learning Greek. So they put me in Greek school twice a week <clears throat> since I was in year one. And I did that through to my higher school certificate in year 12. So um, <clears throat> I finished my high school certificate with Greek. And during that process, I had to learn ancient Greek, how our Greek can be used to understand. Because understanding ancient Greek makes us understand our Greek today so much better. So we have to go through this historical process of looking at the different types of Greek through history. And um, so basically... Uh, I can read, I can write, I can speak, and and, and so on. So, uh, yeah, that's a bit, little bit about me. Uh, All right, let me ask you this real quickly. What is the difference between ancient Greek, point Greek, and modern Greek? Right. So there, I, I wouldn't say there's a huge difference. I would say there's an evolution of language through the millennia. So the first attested Greek could go back to the Mycenaean period, which is sometime first, second millennium, around about 2015. But we, it, could, it could also go back to the, to the Minoans, but we don't really have uh, their language deciphered yet, but it definitely seems that they are some type of Hellenic tribe that lived amongst many other Hellenic tribes. We can call this group Pelasgians if we want. But <clears throat> essentially what um, ancient Greek is, is a language that has not one dialect, but it has multiple dialects from Ionic, Aeolic, um, Attic and so on, and Dorian. And during the Hellenistic period, there was this particular common Greek, it was called Coin Greek, and it was this particular coin, it was more of an Attic Greek, which was projected onto the world at that time. So everyone started speaking this particular dialect of Greek, which we, coin, which we speak Coin. And a lot of the, the Bible itself is um, written in Coin Greek. And then we have medi Medieval Greek, which is a Byzant Byzantine Greek. Um, and again, this kind of evolves all the way till we get to modern Greek today. So yeah, we're talking about you know three, four thousand years of evolution of the Greek language. Um, all right. So um, you can bring up your slides, and, and yeah. I'm gonna have some questions in between so that we can go back and forth. And um, I'm definitely gonna challenge some of the things you're putting forward because I grew up in a, in a culture where. We were taught certain things, so hearing from your side is going to be kind of different from my audience. So, and um, you get the ball rolling, all right? 
Ooh, across the room. No one is sharing. No. Here we go. Can you see that, Gafu? Yes, sir. Did the ancient Greeks describe the ancient Egyptians as black Africans? You know, Gafu, I don't know how to get rid of that toolbar on top, but um, look, it's as best as I'm, as I'm going to get at the moment. No, no, no. We're not, we, we can't see the toolbar. Okay, not a problem. There's no chance that there's no chance we can I can see you and I can see myself. I just I kind of feel that seeing someone talking to someone on my computer kind of gives me a better feeling, Garfield. Are we able to do that? Yeah, we are here. When the um when the slide gets in the way, I'll remove us and then I'll okay. put it back. Right. Perfect. All right. Brother. All right. So we'll go ahead. So some of those groups that I was telling you about uh, that I have, um, Garfield, it's a Hellenic Awakening. Uh, the Stoic Philosophy of Stoicism, Australian Stoic Society, and the Library of Classical Greek Literature. So that's just fitting up, finishing off a little bit about me and some of my groups where you guys can find me. Uh, all right, so I just want to make a disclaimer before we go ahead with this um, presentation. I'm going to be talking about blacks and whites. I might use the word Negro, Negroid, or I might talk about white or burnt faces, and this might all sound very... Uh, racist, but I want to go ahead and make this disclaimer that I'm not intending to be racist or derogatory. We're just talking about, we're actually talking about race, so um, we need to understand that we're going to be talking um, that this type of language. Alrighty. All right, so Garfield, um, it looks like the claim that people are making uh, from the African American community is this, and I want to. Uh, everyone to read it, and I'll, I'll go ahead and read it, because this is what we're going to be challenging today. So here we go. Advocates of the Black African model rely heavily on writings from the classical Greek historians, including Strabo, Diodorus Siculus, Ammianus Marcellinus, and Herodotus. Advocates claim that these classical authors refer to Egyptians as black with woolly hair. The Greek word used was melanchroes. And the English language translation of this Greek word is disputed, being translated by many as dark skin and by many others as black. Now, um, Gaku, is there anything that you want to say in regards to this claim? Yeah, when, it, when you read, a, when you read um, Sheikh Antidia or even um, um, many of the scholars that we have within our communities, they'll regurgitate what um, Sheikh Antidiap wrote Dr. Sheikh Antidiap, and he's one of the most the premier scholars in our community, and so he's well respected, well qualified. So he's respected throughout the community, and you know, no one dares basically challenge him. Right. I think in this instance, he's not the primary source. He's going by what others may have said and other translations. So right. he's technically not at fault. He's basically going by what a source says, and he's just repeating what the source says. Yeah, I, sure. I don't think he was a Greek. Um, I don't think he could read and understand Greek. I know he was, he yeah. was a French speaker, and most of his work is in French. But um, as far as the works, he's actually quoting other people. So he's not really at fault per se, but he's just going by probably old translations or what old writers wrote. But this is the biggest argument with the word melancros. Yeah, this is definitely the biggest argument. So if I go ahead and challenge this, uh, I think the, I really think after my presentation, we could actually put a, uh, a note on this Wikipedia, Wikipedia link and say, look, on this particular day, on the Garfield show, we kind of uh, went ahead and uh, debunked this. So um, I'm hoping someone uh, out there can make the note after hearing this presentation and... Uh, if I feel that I did a good job in presenting the information, um, yeah, I'd like to see that. So uh, let's go from here. So, yeah, so there seems to be a confusion among scholars about this word. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at the, 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 what, the, what the confusion is. So here, here, is, the, <clears throat> here is the particular um, passage in Greek from Herodotus. Now, <clears throat> Herodotus... Um, actually 
this is not to say to take anything away from Herodotus, but when we when we talk about Herodotus, we, we, it's very clear that we take these things with a grain of salt. I mean, he was talking about um, golden griffins guarding, uh, guarding some gates. Um, he even thought that Egyptian women pee sitting down while men pee, uh, sorry, women pee standing up and men uh, pee sitting down. He goes ahead and tells us all these weird stories and sometimes they contradict each other. And so it's very careful that we kind of, but this is not to say anything about the passage of Herodotus, but it's it's very important that we take his, even, it's, this, isn't, this is not coming from um, today's standards because today we kind of look at Herodotus, ah, his, some of his stuff is nonsensical. But even in the ancient days, there were people like Plutarch who wrote books against Herodotus saying, on the malice of Herodotus, saying that, hey, Herodotus was a bit of a philo barbaros. He was a bit of a friend of the barbarians because he he looked at the Persian with, Persians with greatness and he thought that the Persians was a free world and that, you know, the Greeks should submit. He had this kind of attitude that um, the Greeks took everything from everyone else. So he's coming through with an agenda. Um, but it's very interesting that we read Herodotus, but at the, at the same time, um, it's very important that we um, take his information with a grain of salt. Um, so, look, the second word, ulotriches, over there, that just means curly. We might think of the word urumbos, or there's many words, and this just means circular or circle. In regards to when it says ulotriches, the triches is just literally follicles or hair, so curly hair, squiggly hair, however you kind of want to say it. I can see many people do it as woolly hair, you can. There's other words we could use for wool as well. But, um, yeah, so we just want to really look, concentrate on melancholos because this, it's this particular word that uh, people are having an issue. And the, com and the confusion is because there are scholars out there that are, may, uh, that are writing it with uh, dark skin. Some of our people are writing it with black skin. And other people are, are putting it down as swarthy. So, and, it, and to be honest, it's, the confusion is that there is no word directly that we could use from the Greek and use it in English. This word is not, not in our English language. It's a word that's untranslatable. So what these scholars are doing, they're trying to use the best words they have in the English language to describe this word melancholos. So since they can't use the word itself, they have to use other technical terms from the English language to try to explain this word. And some of them are poor translations and some of them are better translations. The one underneath, which I never knew this word, swarthy, I think it's a German word actually, and it just means, okay, well, I haven't put it probably, but it means dark skin, you find a swarthy complexion attra attractive, not everyone dark is swarthy, the word is usually used to describe someone whose skin is weather beaten and darkened by the sun or has a or has an olive complexion, that word is. But um, <clears throat> so that's kind of giving us a definition, but I don't like that definition. It's not an English word that's very common to many, uh, but it's very close on exactly what it's trying to say. Um, I like the word dark, but still it doesn't capture its essence, but it's probably one of the better ones. Black to me is a very absolute color. And I don't think black is a very, uh, very good color to use because it's absolute. And melancholy was, we'll go and say it cannot be an absolute color. Um, so this is the confusion um, because scholars are trying to find an English word to go ahead and substitute this particular Greek word that doesn't appear, that doesn't have its um, English alternative. Now, if we wanted to directly translate this word, first of all, we would understand that melanchroe, even though to us it sounds like one word, melanchroe is actually two words. There's the word melan and the word chroe. Now, melan, we can see that this word can make that English word that we use today, melanin. So the root to the roots of this word melancholy do exist in the English language, but they don't exist as one word in the English language. But the, the, the actual um, prefixes and the suffixes, they exist indirectly in the English language um, for alternative things, many things which we'll get into. So melan, we can think of as melanin, and chroe is that word chroma where we think of colour or that chromatic scheme. I think it's the deepness or the darkness of, oh, I don't understand exactly how the contrast of the green, but the chromatic scheme, it's got to do with the hues and, and, and that kind of stuff. So we can translate chroe as chroma or colour. It's very similar. So melan, 
melanin and color. We can get these two words. And if we wanted to make a word in English, sorry to make this word up, but it would be something like melanin color. So what I'm getting at is that <clears throat> this doesn't make sense to us. So they could have used this kind of term, but it wouldn't have made sense in English. So they're trying to use English words that are known and trying to substitute. But even within, even within this word, word melon color, what, what we understand is that melanin is, a, is that pigment in our, skin, in our skin that's when it's exposed to UV light, it becomes darker. Your skin becomes melanated. You be actually be, become darker than you before. That melanation process is is what you, you would call as call someone as melanchroes. So melanin color, even though today we you, people use this word for melanated people, it's been kind of hijacked by black Africans to mean, hey, we're the melanated people. But really, this is just our subjective understanding how people are using the word. But if we actually look at it scientifically, it's got the word melanin, which is not an absolute. It's something that increases and uh, it's a color. So that's how you would directly translate it if you wanted to. But like I said, it wouldn't make sense. But I'm just trying to give you the essence of what the word says so you have a better understanding of what, where melanchroes is coming. Now, at, at the same time, I want to go ahead and let you guys just read this for a second. Greek words can be challenging to translate due to their complex grammatical structure and unique linguistic features. Greek has a very rich vocabulary which various prefixes and suffixes of words forms which can make it difficult to find precise equivalents in other languages. Translating untranslatable Greek words often involves finding the closest possible approximation of providing detailed explanations to convey the true essence of the word. So um, just, just, just on a quick note, I'm actually um, translating Marcus Aurelius at the moment. I've been doing it for six months on and off, 20, 30 minutes a day. It's a long and exhausting process. But I've got three or four English translations, and what I've noticed is two lines in Greek that Marcus writes. There are three or four lines in English, five lines, two paragraphs sometimes, and what they're doing, they're trying to find, they're trying to find these words that they can't really explain in English because English doesn't have the vocabulary to explain the eloquence of the Greek, so they're trying to use extra technicalities of the words. And something that is very simple in two lines um, it becomes two, two paragraphs in English. And um, so uh, what I'm getting at, it's, it's kind of very hard to actually translate Greek. And when you do it, you always pervert it somehow because you're changing words in their, in their very positions. And if you don't do it properly, it can mean something completely different. So I want everyone to be very aware of that. And another thing I wanted to get at is that the Greek language is itself, um, the names of things in the Greek language are not just characteristics of things. They're, they're naming themselves, they are describing words. They are descriptive terms for naming things. So the Greeks never really named anything non-descriptively. They always had some type of this. Uh, some type of astrological constellation that wasn't found before. Usually you name it in Greek, something in medicine, a new disease. They all have these Greek prefixes. We always go to the Greek. And I just wanted to show people what I mean because I really want people to understand the Greek when we, as we go forward. For example, the word geometry, there's two words. One's, one's geo, ye, which is earth, and then one's measurement, to, you know, that, to measure the, the, the earth or chronometry which is chrono and metric, chrono meaning time, you know, the measurement of time. On the other side, we might have anthropology, which is anthropos, human and logos. So if we didn't have this one word in Greek, anthropology, if we didn't have that word in, in our English language today, we would have to use very technical, very other terms to make this word. We might have to say the study of human beings. So all of a sudden, one word in Greek becomes five words in the English language. So... Yeah, so if that makes sense. Uh, sorry, Garfield? I was saying interesting, interesting. Yeah, so look, with, when we're talking about the English language, you're talking about a very multi-dimensional language. It's not a very you know, singular surface level English. English itself has so many borrowings of Greek that if we take all the Greek words out of our English language, 
we wouldn't be able to communicate that food. We wouldn't be able to say things like idea, telephone, school, philosophy, or, or so on. So, it, and, and so it's really telling of how powerful the Greek language is. Um, so moving forward, as we were talking about descriptive terms, and I was showing how some descriptive terms in some technical terms and scientific terms, how they have Greek roots. Also in colour, these colours that are in Greek, they're also descriptive terms. They are, they are describing something, these colours, to give you the understanding of what the colour is. They're not just mere grunts, like in English, like we might say green or black or something that is not really descriptive. But here, orange is a descriptive term. When we think of orange, we actually think of an orange as well, the fruit, which kind of, oh, okay, so it kind of gives us that form of the idea in the mind and we kind of understand that colour. And that's very similar how Greek works. Now, over here, I've given you our colours. Now, these colours are, are actually not complete. There are many colours are missing, but someone's done their best to kind of give you an understanding of some of the colours or how the Greeks viewed colours. And the Greeks viewed very colours very differently to us. I don't want to get into that because it's a very long and exhaustive discussion, but I just want to go ahead and show you some of these colours. And right now, you can see the colour black and you, and you see melas there. And that's not a problem at all. And you also see kelainos. There's also athalos and athalis, the word to burn. Uh, uh, and and that we could also use that word to go there. There's a few others, erim, erimos as well, that we could use. But And there's other colours missing everywhere else. But uh, Garfield, what I'm going to go here, what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to give you some examples and you're going to go ahead and I'm going to let you speak when I ask you what this particular word is, but I'm going to I'm going to train you in the Greek so you have a good understanding and you that you'll be able to kind of go ahead and uh, give me the answer, and uh, we'll go from there. So when we're talking about descriptive terms in the Greek language, the word green, for example, is the word prasinos. You can see it in the brackets there, uh, Garfield. Prasinos. Now this word here, its etymology, it's a leak. That's what it is. It's a leak, and so. The leek has given the word prasinos in the Greek language. It's describing something. We're describing something in nature. So when an artist is saying, give me some prasin, give me some prasino, the artist is going to give him, <clears throat> he certainly will give him a, a varied of green, like a leek, if that makes sense. Now, there we have a blue color, yakintos. Interesting, interesting uh, uh, just to stop you for a second, the word kia nails on top, I will send it to you if you want, but Hesiod uses it for the people in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, he calls them the blue people, uh, which is very interesting. And Kianos is, Kianos is very, it's, a, it's, it's our English word that comes from Kian, cyan, cyan color, or cyan, I don't know how you would say it, but it's more of a light blue, it was more of a dark blue uh, or a navy blue. So being a navy blue, maybe Hesiod decided to call them. Time out, time out, one second, one second, a question. You said Humanos, they were using it for the Ethiopians, where the Ethiopians are today, are the new, they're talking about the new things. So to describe, to describe the black Africans, this word was used by Hesiod. And not only, not only was it used by Hesiod, but nearly all European countries, this, it's, it's this particular word that is also used for the colour as navy blue and also to describe um, African people too. But I, 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 I hold, on hold on one second. What time period was this guy writing this though? What, what time period? We, we, we don't know, but we, the scholars are saying around the 8th century. Right. 8th century BC? Yeah. Wow. And it's in his, works, in his works of days. But um, yeah, he, he does call them uh, and I'll, I'll send you the link to that. Um, but um, that, that, we're going off. In a, we're going off in a travel there. But anyway, the word that I've now, that I've started to look at is yakintos. 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 As you can see it in the in the brackets, it's the color of a hyacinth. Hyacinth. What's a hyacinth? Garfield. There's that plant that has that. It's a plant that has that 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 color that the Greeks describe as yakintos. Yakintinos. Now we're nearly done, and um, okay, the next one, piros, piros. Piros is also the color, as you see in the etymology, pir, fire. So when the Greeks 
wanted to get a bit of use a bit of beer as a color. The, the description of the, the, the description of the fire itself had given rise to, to the name of the color itself as well. So that it's describing something. Now we're going to get to black now. And we're going to look at Melas. Now the th first thing I wanted to no notice is uh, we have two different dialects, and in the etymology, it doesn't give us an etymology here for this one reason I noticed, but I've I've found it. But the etymology here tells us it comes from some Proto-European male. Uh, Proto-Indo-European, um, I kind of want to steer away from that. Proto-European language, it's a hypothesis. The language itself, we have no found, no existent. Scholars have made up a hypothetical language and have called it Indo-European. And I don't, uh, there is disputes about this. So I want to use, I want to look at the etymology and then just say, look, let's, let's keep going from here. But if people want to go ahead and look at the Proto-Indo-European because they feel like there's some truth in that, by all means, go ahead, um, because that might have something important to say down the line. Uh, but in regards to uh, the definitions here, what we do find is that, number one, it says something that is dark in colour, sometimes it's so dark, dark as to lack colour. Example, black. I'm fine with that definition. That's very true. Sometimes you can. Sometimes the colour is so dark that you can't see the colour itself, and it's, we could call it black. But that's sometimes. Um, but number one, it's dark in colour, and sometimes so dark, so as to call it black. So let's go with that. So let, let's go with that definition, and let's see how we can use that in, in, in Greek sentences later on. But meanwhile, it could also mean something that's evil, dark, black meaning figuratively like uh, darkness or obscure. So it's not just uh, a colour. There's a variety of different ways we could use this word in the Greek language. And it's also, it's, it's also can be used the same in the English language, which we'll see later on. But I just wanted to give you this garfield and let you know that we're going to go with number one because that's the one that kind of fits the category that we're, we're going to be looking. We're not going to be talking about figuratively or medicine or anything to do with that. We're going to be talking dark, uh, mel mel melas, as a color, and it's dark in color, sometimes so dark as the light color. Okay, so let's see how we can use this. Now, this is going to be your turn, Garfield. Now, I'm looking at a color here, and in the top bracket, it says chloros. Chloros. Interestingly enough, that word is given rise to our word chlorine indirectly. Anyways, there's a second color here, Garfield, and the second word says chloro. Now, now, Garfield, I want to. I want you to answer this, Garfield. If chloros is green, what would chloromelas be, Garfield? Um, it wouldn't be black green, but it would be dark green. <laughs> Absolutely, because black green doesn't make sense, does it, Garfield? Exactly. You would, you would sound like a kindergarten trying to say that. Not even a kindergarten would say that. <laughs> so, so for someone to say black, it would be very, very, no, um, it's absolutely wrong. So yes, you actually did that yourself. So the way I taught you the creep, you actually went along and you actually gave me the correct answer. Melas can also be used for clouds. I've heard being used melanophos. And you wouldn't, we, wouldn't really, we wouldn't really say black clouds. I mean, clouds are not really black. I mean, this is absolute black. This is what we're talking about, black. So. Clouds can be dark. They usually have a hue when you think about it. They kind of start off white and when it starts to get, as it gets darker, these clouds starting to get darker and darker, like a gray dark, and then they can get to like a very dark. But that process of dark is melanin for so the dark clouds. They're not black clouds. They're dark clouds, just like dark green and not black green. So I hope you're following that. And, um, and um, have you got anything to say before we keep on going, Garfield? Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, and um, I guess we're going to get to um, Melas being the root of Melancros. Is, is that where we're going? Because That's where we're on. getting, yeah. But I just oh. wanted to show you, I wanted to show everyone how we use the word in Greek. Okay. 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 And, and now that you've got on a bit of a taste, you kind of understand how it can be used. And it's not always, it's not always used as black as people say, because it would be very simple for us to say black green. Okay, so... <clears throat> And um, there we go. So interestingly enough, when we look at the etymology, it says chloros, green, 
and then plus melas to just give us the the the, the black. When we look at the the down the bottom the, the the what it is, it gives us the actual dark green because it wouldn't say black green. But the root of the words I use at the top as black and green. But the answer is dark green down the bottom, as you can see it. And um, we're going to look at the word Milan in ancient Greek. So just a little bit, I know it's getting a little bit tenuous, mate, but uh, stick with me. So <clears throat> this is just a dictionary with all these Mel roots and Milan roots. And we look, when we look at the word underlying there in the middle, Milan, it gives, it gives rise to all these other words underneath it, like melancholia, melancholia, severe so depression in English. When I'm, feeling, when I'm feeling a little bit melancholy inside, feeling a little bit dark and depressed, so not black. Okay, um, you know, skin cancer melanomas is those cancers that kind of get darker and darker. And when they get really, really dark, the doctor tells you, hey, you've got to take them out, cancerous. Um, so, yeah, so melanosis, a form of hyperpigmentation, increased melanin. So, like, yeah, people can get all these things. But what I'm trying to get at is, hey, there are so many, there are rivers in there, there are names. I'm not sure if you can see four or five words from the, from the bottom. Melanie, that's a name. Melanie is a name. You can also think of melanin. So melanie means dark, but not everyone that's named melanie is dark. But um, <clears throat> so there's rivers there and, and so on. But I just wanted to show you how this root melan, we could also use it in English to mean uh, many different things. Uh, following Garfield? Yes, I am. All right. So I also want people to know that the Greek word today that we use is called, is evolved to melachrinos. And this has come from, as you can see, the etymology from this Hellenistic common, melanchrinos, which comes from melanchris, melanchros, melanchris, and melaschros. So what I'm showing, what I wanted to show people is the word hasn't changed in Greek. It actually means the same thing. It means that a dark skin, someone who has dark features or black hair or dark hair, dark skin. Um, so the word itself in my modern Greek means exactly what it did 2,000 years ago. Uh, so... I really wanted to show people because there would be people that are saying, well, I'm, I'm not speaking the language of the ancients, but yes, we do. Um, sometimes you will see the word melanchros as melanchros changing from melanos, me, melanis, and it's because in Greek, the word, the word can change for gender, masculine, feminine, neutral, whether you're talking about uh, many people, not just one person, plural, and so on. So what I wanted to show you is that the word itself, unlike in English, can grow and, and kind of mean uh, a lot different kind of uh, meanings. Uh, and yeah, and something else I wanted to show is this particular one, melanteros and melantatos, which I don't have here. I don't know why. Uh, anyways, uh, what I want to show that the Greek word itself why it would be better to use the word dark instead of black for the English language is because when we think of melas, which means dark, we could also say melanteros, which means darker, or melantatos, darkest. Now, if we were to try to do this with the word black, um, black, blacker, black's absolute. How can you get blacker than black? Mm -hmm. Are you feeling me, uh, Garfield? Makes sense. Makes so it's, sense. A very, it's a very poor translation. It's not a wrong translation. It's a poor translation because it is not consistent at all if we use the term black. But the word dark or swarthy or some other words I can think, they are fairly consistent with this particular way that I'm kind of showing everyone. And I'm just showing you other words, how they work, big, bigger, bigger, megas, to megistos, philos, philetoros, philatotos, and so on. So uh, anything you want to say regards to dark, darker, and darker? Do you understand what I mean when I say yeah, black? You can't get black yeah, blacker than black. And tons tons black is an absolute. Yeah, you're making, you're, making, you're making a lot of sense. I am. Okay. I hope I am, Garfield. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is, Garfield, is um, uh, geez, I just lost my train of thought. But um, yeah, a anything you want to say before I go to the next, next one, uh, Garfield? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good right now. All right. So I've showed you how it could be used in Greek. And oh, no, one, one question. At Absolutely. the top, up we have dark, darker, darkest. So how would you pronounce the word dark here at the top? 
explain that to me, sorry, Garfield. The words at the top that you're saying is dark, darker, and darkest. How would you yes. pronounce those words? Mel in Greek, is that what you're saying? In, in English. So in English, you would pronounce them as they're written, Garfield, dark, darker, and darkest. Right. But in, in Greek, it would be what? So in Greek, it would be the same word uh, in Greek to use melas and to be darker than as the darker to say that someone is dark. So I could say that I am melanos and you're melanteros. Uh, does that make sense? Right, right, right. So I'm, you're dark and I'm darker. Absolutely. Right. All right, cool. All right, so that would melas. Okay, all right. I'm just trying to get the words right that, that in the Greek. All right. I understand. And someone, and someone in southern India can be melantotos, darker than both of us. Uh, if that makes sense, Garfield. But the thing is, Garfield, that today we have this understanding, um, black and white. It's a very Americanized thing. So we've segregated society into two colors. So what do we mean when we mean by white and black today? Uh, because we have this conception that when we say white and black, it's just two people. There's two kinds of people. There's just whites and blacks. So I don't consider myself why? I'm hey, John, John, if, you, if, black. if you're walking in New York, we would think you're probably from Puerto Rico. Sorry, from where? We would think you're from Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic. So we wouldn't say that you're from Greek. Interesting. If, we look, if, we, if we're going by a location. Yeah, right. like, this Puerto Rican guy? <laughs> you know, so I like that. that's I like based that. on like location. That. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's really what? So when we have white and black, it kind of puts, there's no middle ground, there's nothing. So yeah. terms like swarthy and dark helps us out to understand. In a yeah, yeah, because it means there's, there's a Green complexion, there's a, yeah, absolutely, mate, you're understanding, there's a, there's a hue in the word, there's a, there's a um, how would I call it, a spectrum in the word, that black doesn't, is not able to reach at all, because black is absolute. But we can use it, for example, my wife, she's a, She's uh she's from New Zealand. She's a Maori, uh, mm. Polynesian Maori from New Zealand, and I might say something to my wife, and she goes, "Is it is it because I'm black?" And my wife is whiter than me. Uh -huh. So you can understand how people use the word today. We use it very subjectively. Um, so we should really take away our goggles from the way we use words today, because in in Asian times we don't, we don't we don't have these particular notions that are kind of in our society today. So we kind of really, really, really need to look at the world in the context of Herodotus in that world, not in our today and age, and we have a better understanding. But I think you've got a better understanding in regards to how we're going ahead with Melanchos and how it can be used and uh, why dark is better than black and so on. But um, yeah, I'll keep going anyways, Garfield. All right, go ahead, my brother. Ah, bugger. Okay, sorry, Garfield. So I kind of wanted to show him the word darkest and dark, dark uh, darker and darkest and um, that was the particular one down the bottom that I want to show everyone um, <clears throat> but um okay so all right so interestingly enough now Garfield this is going to be very interesting now the word melas is right down the bottom the last line and in this particular dictionary I have gone back to see where this mel root comes. Where does this mel root arise? And when we come back, we get right on top of the screen to that root word mel, mel, which gives rise to all these melancholies and melampholas and melanas and melancholias and melas and, and so on. It is this particular word mel which gives rise to all these words as the prefix which is in melas. And this is the word that we want to go look at. So we're going to go have a look at this word mel. And I want to also want to show how melas can be used as feminine as melis and melee and whatever. And that, that the word melis in its plural form, and its plural form, as we look at its etymology, as we can say melas or melis. It's not on this page. Here we go. So meli. At the top here in our etymology, we're at mel. We can see the mel in the brackets. It has the I. Or you could put the A, A, S for melas, depending on how you want to use this word. 
It's up to you. If you want to make it in its substantive form, male, melas, or you can use it in its melis form. And when we look at its melis form, it gives us its related words for honey. And when we look at the word for honey in Greek, it's mel, meli, meli. So the word melas has a, has a root word, a prefix which is mel, and the word melis, which is also a word used for honey, it also comes with this prefix mel, which is very telling, which is very telling because melis means honey in Greek. Today in Greece, we have a company, it's called Bela, Melas Bee Factory, and they do honey. Uh, not only honey can be different types of colors, it's not a, it's a darkness to it, but it can get so dark that you can't really see through it. That's how dark it can get, or it can get light dark. But what I'm getting at here, Garfield, is that it would be even better to say that the Egyptians were honey skinned, and the reason why I say that is because of this. If we say the word melas, if we say that melancho, the word melanos, melancho, it comes from melas, it's dark, not a problem. But it's also likely that the word is rooted in melis. And if it's melis, it's honey skin. But don't get confused because both these words have a common root, which comes from mel which is telling of the characteristic of honey and how we view the word melancholos in regards to in regards to color as well. It is that hue. So to say that someone is honey skin would be perfect to say that is melancholos. Because melancholos is really is that really that dark, sun drenched, tan skin, sun kissed skin. It is that darkness that it's weather building that can get dark and dark and darker. Um, just wanted to show people um, honeys um, in the ancient world. Um, and when we look at honey in processed in Egypt, we can see that the same color of honey is also likely the same color that the Egyptians used for themselves. You can see the same hue, you can see the same uh, color, on, and there's many more. And the Egyptians themselves varied in so many different colors from, from dark, to darker, to very darkest. Uh, and um, um, to say that these people are just black would be saying that these people are just one absolute color. But when we look at this word and we change melancholis to mean honey skin, well, with this, we understand there's a better context in understanding these people's color by viewing the different types of honey hewing in, in honey and so on. Um, so. Let me give you a little pushback a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, would you be. Melancholos and uh, can I be melancholos at the same time? Yeah, we will. So, would you consider us to be both dark, uh, Garfield? I I would say I'm dark. You're a bit lighter than I am. Well, you'd be right. darker than you'd be darker than how the Greeks look. All right, then. that's a that's a very interesting pushback. So let me go ahead and give you my answer now, Garfield. Mm -hmm. So this particular photo over here, Garfield, that just to get people to understand, you know, the difference between black and tan, this is not a different foot. Uh, this is the same person. This is a photo of the hand and foot of the same Greek fisherman that lives in Crete in the, middle, in the Mediterranean. And he's a fisherman and he wears boots all day in the sea. Mm -hmm. And his feet are white and withered and kind of in the water, where his, his <coughs> hand is. I would look at his hand right now, Garfield, and I would say, his hand is dark. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Well, I've, just, I've just used this word for a Greek now. Isn't that crazy? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. But, um, so, look, just, just for that pushback, I hope that answered the question. Or do you, would you like me to kind of, um, you know... Well, you just beat me up. You just daggered me right there. <laughs> I'll go ahead and keep throwing those daggers then, Garfield. <laughs> oh man, that's very interesting. So that see. means that means if if Herodotus was writing, or any any Greek in that time period, they would say he's melancholos. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And and sometimes they, they even they even I'll show you later that 
well, these people are darker than those people, then these people are darker than them. So they're trying, they know that the word itself doesn't give you an absolute. So they're trying to say, hey, hey, well, it's this dark, not that, not that this Ethiopian dark, if you know what I mean. So you'll see that later on because, um, yeah, like I said, uh, melancholy it's a spectrum. It's not an absolute color. Not at all. Um, yeah. So we'll keep on going, Garfield. Oh, a very interesting, Garfield. What I wanted to also say, in regards to this, this honey um, prefix that I got, which gives us the words for dark and for honey and for all these things, uh, by reading Melanie in a particular uh, uh, Google uh, look, it showed that, yeah, Melanie can also mean dark, black, and it also means another form, sweet like honey or honey itself, uh, meaning honey. So what what I'm getting at, when I'm getting at, people are seeing, the, it's not just me that's seeing this, and like I just did a little bit of a look to see what other people I'm saying. These are not anything scholarly. You, uh, John's just pulling up things from Google. Yeah, I am. Go, ahead, go and do them yourself too because people are saying, hey, Melanie is derived from this Greek word melas, but it also can mean honey, brave, strength. Yeah, absolutely it does. Um, so... Someone's here saying, according to a Greek woman, I used to know Melanie means honey, not dark or black, as everyone seems to. I believe that the name Melanie isn't limited to black or dark, or rather black or dark, seeing the meaning of this, Milan comes from this word. Rah, rah. So people are going ahead and trying to understand that hey, there is this connection in this word with honey. And, it's, and I think it's a better way for us to actually examine and look at the Egyptian culture and say that these people were honey skinned because the word honey skin projects a spectrum of color. And so does the word dark. Um, but the word black doesn't. And when we use the word black with our, with our uh, modern goggles on, we also automatically think black of oh, African-American. That's where the mind works because that's the way society has programmed us, believe it or not. Um, but yeah, melancholos would be in dark. That's how they would, uh, that's, that's how they would have, Herodotus and everyone else is using the term back then. And I've showed it. Uh, how I demonstrated it before when we were using dark, darker, and darker, and so on. And what, and how, and I also showed how black is inconsistent when we're looking at the Greek words and how they can be used. Um, so, yeah, um, I'll keep on going. Okay, so this is where I want to talk about another group of people, and these people are called the Aethos, the Ethiopians. Uh, the Ethiopians, my dear friend Garfield, uh, are people who are indigenous to a place that Herodotus said is Libya. For Herodotus, Libya was not a country today where it is in uh, northern Africa, a little cut-out area. No, it was the whole of Africa. Now, this map that we're looking at, it's actually a map from Herodotus histories. It's not a map that he drew, but if you read his histories, this is what the map is projecting. Uh, this is what this particular map is projecting. He's, he's where he went around the area. Um, we can even see the Nile River going all the way to the left because when uh, when Herodotus arrived in Monroe, he didn't really go all the way, but he's seen it kind of steering towards, and he thought that was go it goes that way, but um, he was wrong. So um, yeah, but this is the this is the according to the ancient Greeks, um, uh, according to Herodotus, because by the time of Hellenistic times. The ancient Greeks were circled, circular navigating um, um, Libya and so on. But um, yeah, what I wanted to show you on this map is that there are people on the bottom of Libya called uh, the Ethiopians. And, and um, Ethiopians is a term that the ancient Greeks used to refer to the African American, not to the African, to the sub Saharan Africans of, of ancient Libya or ancient Africa. In, the word itself comes from the word etho. Uh, sorry, over here, guys, I wanted to actually show that <clears throat> even the word what we were talking about before, how the words themselves are not just names that actually mean something. Even the word Europe, Urops, or Evrops, actually can mean <clears throat> wide or open-eyed. So people that have open, more uh, eyes that are more open, if that makes sense, wide gazing. And it's particularly true that Europeans, their eyes are quite kind of um, open-eyed, they're more wide. <clears throat> Actually, the word asia, asiatis or asemetis, means narrow-eyed, which is basically even true today. <clears throat> so 
Greek words actually have descriptiveness to them, uh, which is also applies to the people of Ethiopia, which is a word to also mean ethel, to burn, to burn, from the Greek word athalis, to ignite. Even the word coal in Greek comes from the word athrax, which is that, that rock that you ignite, that coal, that athalis coal that you ignite, if that makes sense. So they're talking about black as an absolute here. The air thops. When you ignite a piece of wood, it goes, it goes, it renders to a very dark, dark, to it gets to a black before it turns to a white ash. It's that <clears throat> ignition that turns that to a burnt. Even if you've seen burnt toast. I know it sounds like I'm being a little bit derogatory, but I really want you to understand how they applied it to these people and they call them the burnt face. And as derogatory as it sounds, it wasn't used derogatory at all because they actually, actually ancient Greeks thought that the black, Af black Africans were the most holiest and pious people and the most beautiful in the world. So even though airtops is something that might sound derogatory, us, it was just a characteristic, characteristic and definition to explain and describe the people who were they, who were they speaking about. And they called them the Ethiopians. And these are the African people, the sub-Saharan African people. Just to keep on going here now, uh, Garfield, um, as I said before, that all black Africans were known as Ethiopians. And Herodotus, and Herodotus tells us, and their iconography was narrowly def defined by Greek artists in the archaic period. So the artists in the archaic, archaic period basically defined what airtops is. Not in written form, in which, but the, although there is written forms, but artistically through sculpture. So when that Greek, ancient Greeks wanted to depict and define what an airtops was, uh, okay, so down at the bottom here, I just wanted to show you guys that uh, 4197 Herodotus describes them as occupying the whole south of Libya. He only, thought, he, only, he, only stopped at, he only stopped at Moreau. He didn't know how far Libya goes, but he basically said all the way down from that middle part that he was at, down to the south, only Ethiopians. And we'll see that in later, later sources later on. So we know who the people is, but he's not speaking the people that are close in the Mediterranean who are around that cradle of civilization, that melting pot up there. He's talking about these airthrops who are in the south and they, they only occupy the south. Not to say they didn't migrate to the north. Of course they did. They migrated everywhere. But to the south is where their, I would say their, how would I, how would I describe it? Their, um, they're, they're more, they will be more majority in, in the south, if that makes sense. Because the, the east, because the north was always, was always subject to migrations where many Greeks didn't go far to the south. Many people didn't go. It was only until later on that people started exploring to the south. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we'll keep on going from here. And I just wanted to show you pictures here of what it describes uh, descriptively of what appears to be um, the characteristics of what can only be um, Africans, African people. And we can see them in ancient Greek art at, as late as the 5th and 6th century. And we can see that they have snub noses, their eyes, their hair. We, I don't look at this person, I don't think he's Greek. Um, I can't see him looking like um, an Egyptian, a Phoenician. He looks what, it, what I would say would be an African, even in our standards today. And this is how the ancient Greeks characterized and defined the black African people. Here is a picture of Hercules and an uh, African warrior. And I think that's very beautiful. Um, in this picture, there is a African head and a female head with a, a Kalos inscription. The Kalos inscription, Kalos means beautiful, uh, Garfield. Um, 
And the Greeks actually thought that they were the most beautiful people in the world. And when the gods were in mythology, they would go to the ends of the earth with the Ethiopians and dwell and, and feast amongst them. So they were very praised in ancient Greek literature. This particular example has the Kalos inscription even on top of the black individual there, the black African woman. You see some little letters up there, it says Kalos. So the idea that black is beautiful isn't something that was came in, in America in the 1970s or something. It goes back to ancient Greece, I feel. Um, yeah, so um, anything you want to say before we go and have a look at the sources now, Garfield? All right. Um, as far as Ethiopia, all right, or Ethiopia, Ethiopia, that word, why didn't they use that word to describe the Egyptians? If, because you just taught me something about another word that could mean black or dark in the earlier, and then, and then they're calling them blue with a blue type of, I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, Scot, the Scots and the Irish call black folks, quote unquote, black people, um, blue people. Wow, I didn't know that. And then when you said something about your, your wife earlier since she's black, Kim Hall, she's an expert on this, an African-American woman here. She's the premier expert on um, blackness in, in the British time period from like the 1500s to like the 1800s. And when you look at the descriptions of folks in England, they call regular white folks black, the ones who are darker. The proper word should have been swarthy, but anybody who is darker than, because the British had this aura about the nipple and they were the ultimate quote unquote white folks. They were the ultimate. Yeah. So the, anybody who's darker than them would be called dark, swarthy, or black. Wow. So your so you're wife saying that, if, and she's from New Zealand, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's very interesting the way you just put that. I just learned something as well. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and then with the Greeks saying that the, the, the Ethiopians, they would call them sometimes blue, puts me in the mode of the Scottish and the Irish doing the same thing for, I don't know, because the word for black in, 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 um, in Gaelic means the devil. So I guess they didn't want to call them the devil, which again goes back to, there's a second category that you showed in the source that says evil or whatever. So I'm not a Gaelic expert, but it, it just rang a lot of bells in my head listening yeah. to you and what you said about your wife. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, All right. All right. So let's examine some of these ancient Greek sources. All right. Before we go into the Greek sources, I'm going to say I'm just playing one hour of this. It's actually a four hour interview we did like three, four in the morning, um, my time. And the brother was in Australia and he had to stay up late, like two o'clock his time to finish the interview. But let's not take this too personal. Just take the information and see what we could study and learn from it. Because personally, the reason why I asked that question about Ethiopes, why didn't they just call the Egyptians if they were quote unquote black? Why didn't they just call them that? Just call him that. Why call him Melancros? So obviously there's something about that word Melancros because that word is used to describe the Greeks by, um, I think, early 800s. And it's also used to describe the Northern Syrians who look like the, the, the folks on the wall with the long beard, light skin like the Libyans. They call those people Melancros. So I'm just saying it seems like it's similar to a word like a swarthy word or a it's just different skin tones. But I think we're fighting for that term black because we call ourselves in the Western world black people. That's just me. I can be wrong. I'm not trying to be right, but that's just how I feel. I think he brought something good to the table. And um, I'm going to rewatch it tonight about 2 in the morning when I get up and just look at it again. But I'm going to actually do this. So next week, Tuesday, is going to be part two. And we're going to have four four um episodes of this and we're gonna we're gonna get it in i think it's a, it's a beautiful thing 
and we got to enjoy the information for what it is. He's not an expert, but he actually knows the ancient Greek language. I don't know a lot of people that do. The premier experts on this are um, Frank Snowden Jr., who is an African-American. So I look at Frank Snowden's work. I look at Clarence Walker's work. And then I look at the other people who work who, who, are, who have the same complexion as I do. And I'm trying to, trying to have a middle ground on this and just, and just have common sense. You know, we here in the West are going to fight for black. Why are they trying to argue about it? This black, they don't argue about white. No, he's saying it, neither term is good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm going to let it go. As a matter of fact, if anybody want to jump on the panel for a good five, ten minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain that. Come on and um, let's talk about it. Or we could just leave it as it is and go to the episode. So if anybody want to jump on and, 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 and have a conversation about this, jump on. I'll, I'll, I'll entertain some people for the next five minutes, hear the criticisms, hear what you learn, and, and, and let's move forward. Not everything is about an argument. You know, he, he, did, he did a decent job in trying to break down melas and melancros and different meanings and how we looked at the words and melancros. I think, he did a, I think he did a good job. I think he did a good job. So if you have some conflict with what he's saying, Let's let's bring it forward. And, and 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 what we're trying to do is look at the Greek. He knows I don't know the Greek, so I have to listen to somebody who actually is trying to. He's not a professional, he's an autodidact. But come on, let's 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 be reasonable with our approach. Oh, I heard this scholar say this, but did the scholar read Greek? Did he understand the context? Did he read the did he know the language? You know, the people come at me, Goffy, you don't read the Egyptian language, so how can you say that? You know what I'm saying? So I don't I don't understand what's the beef with a lot of people, but hey, it is what it is. Hey, what's up? What's up, big bro? Big bro, Rocky, what's up? I'm mute your mic. Yo, you can hear me? Garfield. Oh, yeah, I could hear you. God mind, you're actually correct, but that's what he's saying, though. Yeah. No, 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 no. I know that, but black people, you see, that's the term, but when we say Black people, we mean African Americans, though. That's what we mean. And and and, but I'll get to that another time. It looked like Rocky got a bad bad signal. But um, don't forget this Thursday. This Thursday, um, hey, you know what? Hey, if you look at my my TikTok today, and you look at, I, I'm a show. I'm a show. Um. Let me show God mind that me and him is on the same page. Because if you look at my TikTok right now, or even my uh, my Instagram or anywhere, hold on, let's look at my Facebook for a second. I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna show you something real quick, my brother. Just to say that we're on the same page. Me and you is definitely on the same page, brother. Look at this right here. He says black, we use it to describe different shades. He is right. Look at this right here. This is my Facebook abolitionist born into slavery in Macon. Ellen and William Craft, both born in the 1820s. Both abolitionists born into slavery in Macon, Georgia. In December 1848, they escaped to the northern parts of the United States by traveling by train and steamboat, ending up in the northern parts of the United States in Philadelphia. They achieved this by doing something very odd. Ellen, who looks like a white woman, passed off as the slave master traveling with her slave skin color. That's how they were able to. And by the way, let me say also, um, she dressed up as a man. That's how they actually escaped because a woman couldn't lead a man out of slavery. I actually left that part out to do a part two about that with another storyline. I left it out on purpose, but she dressed up as a man to let her, she and her husband escape slavery. But she is black. She's black. Look at her skin tone. So God might, I don't disagree with you. And I'm not picking one's interpretation, but we need to actually respect another culture and say, what did they mean? Culture. That's the problem. That's the problem. But this lady right here is a black woman. 
and he's a black man. They were married. <laughs> Skin tall, crazy. So, well, it is what it is. All right, peace and love, family. I guess that was the one drop black crew because her father was actually white, supposedly white, you know. But anyway, it's some good stuff. God minded some good stuff. I've been telling you to hit me up in the email, man, so we could build, bro. But um, peace and love to everybody that's listening. Thank you for tuning in. And next week, Tuesday, will be part two. We have part three and part four. We're going to get into some more of this stuff, some talking about this Greek stuff. And don't forget tomorrow, Urban Economic Empowerment Program. I do have um, um, what do, who do I have tomorrow? Hold on one second. Who do I have tomorrow? Let's take a look at who I have tomorrow. Hold on one second, family. I think tomorrow the 7th, I got Jonathan Shorsh at 4.30. I don't know if I want to. I'm going to ask Mo if I could do it at 6 if she's not available. And But we got Jonathan Shorsh talking about crypto Jews, conversion, and African converts to Judaism. So that should be a good show tomorrow. It is also pre-recorded. But I want to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. And thank you for the respect and honor in the chat. All right? Peace and love. And we will talk tomorrow. Peace. Thanks for tuning in.